you. Uh, I'm Guy Wallace. I'm a performance analyst and an instructional architect. I've been doing this since 1979. I've been an external consultant since 1982. I first became a member of ISPI back in the days when it was NSPI when I joined what is now the Michigan chapter, this chapter, back in September of 79. Uh, I'm a past board director at the international level. I'm a past president of the international organization. I uh, am a co-founder of the Charlotte ISPI chapter. And I see that Oliver Pincus is, is in the audience here and he's a past member of that uh, chapter as well as a, fact, a, a chapter leader as well. Uh, in 2010, I received uh, ISPI's Honorary Life Member Award. I'm not sure exactly why. Um, I've authored 15 books, many articles, um, and I started a, a video series that some of you might be interested in, the HPT video series. I started it back in 2008 with Joe Harless, now the late Joe Harless. I have 136 videos of HPT practitioners. I'm trying to demonstrate the diversity of HPT practitioners and their HPT practices. We're not always clear on exactly what's inside the box of HPT and what's outside the box. And so it was part of my intent to help clarify that. This is my 39th uh, presentation to an ISPI chapter since 1982. This is my seventh uh, presentation to this chapter. I'm not sure what your problem is, but I'm happy to participate. My experience for last year is I wrote my uh, 15th book last year. I spent a good amount of time on that um, about uh, conducting in a performance-based instructional analysis. And the premise of the book was that we shouldn't try to do analysis in one huge effort at one point in time. I like to spread it out across the duration of an addy like framework for con uh, conducting instructional development projects. I was greatly influenced by the late Gary Rumler, who was uh, from the University of Michigan. And uh, when I first went to work in the business and in Saginaw, Michigan in 1979, I was heavily influenced by Gary Rumler, Tom Gilbert, uh, Dale Brethauer, Joe Harless, and Bob Mager, and some of the uh, gurus of, of the society. So I'm very happy to be here and uh, to hear what everybody else has to say. Thank you. Uh, so I'm semi-retired and uh, not as active uh, with clients as I once was, but as I, uh, watch our profession through various social media, I'm, I'm happy to see uh, a move from everything being synchronous to a movement towards asynchronous content. Um, not everything needs to be done live, not, you know, so to make our content, our instructional content accessible in a timely fashion for the target audience and their management, the more we can move content from group paced, whether it's virtual or face to face, to self paced, I think is a benefit. Now, when I was at Motorola back in 1981-82, our leader, Bill Wiggenhorn, came back from a visit to all of his key stakeholders throughout North America and came back and asked his staff to move everything from group paced to self paced that we possibly could. And of course, there's a time and a place for group, group paced training, but, but not everything has to be. And I think we tend to lean towards group pace. We've made a big movement to virtual content when we could have produced resources instead of courses. We could have focused more on job aids. We could have focused more on videos that were that can be timed for the convenience of the target audience and not some predetermined schedule created by somebody somehow. That's pretty much all I have to say. That's, that's an example of blended. So we're blending synchronous and asynchronous. We can blend all sorts of media that are appropriate to the content, to the performance that we're trying to hopefully focus on. So I think that hopefully the pandemic pushes us towards better practices in that regard. Uh, I, I think, well, I agree with what everything has been said here. Um, I guess I'd like to uh, shift the, this a little bit towards I think we too often default to in our instructional response to an instructional request to training. And I think we should consider, uh, those of you who go back a ways will know who Gary Rumler and Tom Gilbert are, but the, they had a company called Praxis 
back in the 1960s. And I was given a newsletter of theirs from September of 1970, where they talked in that newsletter about guidance, what later became known as job aids and electronic performance support systems, nowadays performance support or workforce learning, workflow learning. And I, I think we should really focus on when can we be more e just as effective and more efficient when we give people job aids versus training. And we should reserve training time when we really need to hone a skill, you know, sales call skills and things like that. But, you know, you can't reference something in the middle of your sales call. But we expect people to memorize way too much. We, we expect them to impossibly memorize way too much. And if we were to give them a job aid so that they can use it in the workflow when it's needed on demand, we'd serve our clients much better. So there's a time and a place for training or learning or instruction or whatever label you want to give it. But uh, we should think more about resources instead of courses, which is one of the new buzz phrases nowadays. <laughs> That's, that's the heart of what I learned at NSPI and ISPI way back throughout, throughout my association with the organization. The late Gary Rummler's got several videos out, one from 1981 and two from 1986, uh, where he talks about you know, when he would do analysis for an instructional project, the first thing he would always look at is, is there a process? If there is one, is it adhered to or not? And if not, why not? So that what he would focus on that. And then he would look at what I call the environmental enablers. He would say, it's usually the consequence system. The consequence system too often rewards bad behavior, poor behavior, and punishes good behavior. We give our best employees more work than anybody else. We let the people who don't do as well work, do less work. And there's many other examples of that. But so one of the things I learned from him is to not focus initially on the individual, the people in the process, but to look at the process itself, look at the other environmental enablers, that, uh, that context, and before we start going and trying to fix people. Because most often, and the late quality expert, W. Edwards Deming said 94% of uh, performance problems, I'm paraphrasing here, are not due to individuals or teams. It's not due to the people, it's due to the system. And management is in control of that system. So we need to look elsewhere when we're solving performance problems. Uh, one of my catchphrases is training requests for new hires should be expected. Training requests to solve problems should be suspected. We need to <laughs> sus be suspicious like of that. <laughs> the request for training. We shouldn't say, are you sure it's a training problem? Joe Harless taught us that in 85. Not to say, are you sure it's a training problem? But to say, sure, I can help you. And I can help you even more if you let me do a little of this front end analysis, as he called it. So we need to, we need to work with our clients and work with their best people to find out what's at the root of the symptoms that causes a training request. Unless, of course, it's for new hires, because, yeah, of course, they need training. Let me start by showing you that I'm going to model what I'm going to talk about. This is my job aid. Um, so I've mentioned before that, uh, you know, we need to start uh, looking beyond just content creation uh, for instructional package, training, learning, whatever, whatever label you want to give it, and really look at providing that kind of guidance, uh, job aids, electronic performance support systems, so that people can take advantage of them in the workflow. Um, sometimes people can use a job aid and, and then forget about it. There is no learning that happened. They just use the job aid. And if you uh, ask them, you know, exactly what they did, they may not be able to tell you because learning isn't always the important thing. It's the ability to perform the tasks to produce outputs to the various stakeholder measures. Uh, stakeholders have requirements. And so we need to help performers, not necessarily learners, but performers perform on the job. And that doesn't always require learning where they have memorized something. And I think that's that was my point earlier. We need to quit expecting people to memorize everything because they can't. And we need to provide them and enable them to perform in the workflow, uh, what we used to call process back in the old days. So that's, I think, where we need to start. We need to really start uh, focusing on enabling performance and not think about everything as a learning uh, a package, if you will. I think what we need to stop 
is we need to stop doing projects without analysis on the front end. We need to focus on performance. We need to understand what the terminal output is, what Gilbert called worthy outputs. Uh, that's what comes from the word accomplishment. You know, he was focused not on, on training or instruction, but on accomplishments, which is the ability to produce a worthy output, uh, an output that meets stakeholder requirements, if you will. Um, and then what tasks, what uh, physical tasks, what cognitive tasks, are employed in producing that output. We need to fully understand that and then decide how do we enable that? Is it something that in the performance context is on demand and there's no time to reference job aids or whatever you wanna call them? And it has to be committed to memory. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Overcoming objections is a sales call. It's not something that you can say, well, hold on a minute here. Let me check my job aid here on how to uh, respond to your challenge. So we need to be judicious in, in where we produce instructional content for the purpose of people memorizing things and honing skills. And we need to think more about producing the kinds of resources that will help them in the workflow. Uh, what, we, what we need to continue doing is continue focusing on the science of performance improvement and within that, the science of learning. Um, there's a lot of myths that abound. And one of the things I've always appreciated about ISPI, because I'm an accidental trainer, I have a radio TV film degree and entered in the training business through that side door. And I was lucky to be uh, coached and guided and developed in, in the Rumler and Gilbert and Harless and Mager kinds of methodologies. But um, we, we need to focus on performance first. We need to understand the science of learning and what works. We need to avoid the myths such as learning style and multi-generational differences. And there's a whole raft of those. And, and that's what the thing I appreciated most about ISPI as a accidental trainer, not formally schooled, educated in all of this is that when I attended conferences, I very much appreciated when, and there was two people in particular that used to do this in the 80s and in the 90s, they were told to stop it. But uh, they would stand up and challenge a presenter in the middle of their presentation and, and simply ask, do you have any data to support that? And the other person, their cohort would, was planted on the other side of the room and they would stand up then and say, and data, data is plural. And that was my signal that what I had just heard is probably not necessarily valid. And so, while we got a nasty reputation as a professional organization and speakers would come in and then they'd leave and give us bad feedback because the audience was not nice to them. It was because that they were, they were being held to a standard of, is there what was used to be called research-based, now it's called evidence-based, but is there any evidence for what you're saying? Or is this just something that seems to work, but we don't understand under which conditions it does work and it doesn't work? And I think that that's what I very much appreciate about this professional society, my professional home, is that that's where I got the warnings for what was not valid and what and 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 I learned a lot about what is valid. Of course, research changes as we gather data and all that stuff. So I think we need to continue focusing on what it has evidence behind it and where it doesn't have evidence but seem to work, we need to embrace that. We can't throw it out just because we have evidence, uh, don't have evidence either way. But we've got to avoid things where there is pretty solid evidence that some things just don't work. It, what's interesting about ROI, this has been kicked around and debated for a long time across ISPI and other professional societies, uh, ASDD back in the day, ATD now. But you know, ROI was created back in 1920, I think, by DuPont. And it was really simply to compare alternative ways to invest their money. You know, we've got project A, B, C, and D, and we can't afford all four of them. Which two can we go with? ROI was used to predict what the return on that investment would be. It wasn't to pin it down. Absolutely. It was simply to, you know, what's the cost of money? What Project A needs to use something that's the same as everybody else's so that they can't gain that to push their project. So too often ROI is used after the fact when, when it should have been used up front in the first place to say, is there a sufficient return on this investment to, to warrant doing this? And if it's not, then maybe we need to look for cheaper ways like give them a job aid. Um, <laughs> I love your job aids guy, because yeah. I, I, can't, I can't memorize anything. So I love job aids. 
<laughs> but, but so so when we use ROI, when we think about ROI, and that's going to be a track in the, in the upcoming conference, is that, you know, we too often it's used as a gotcha. Aha, you didn't have the return on ROI. Well, ROI is pretty much baked in when somebody selects a project for you to work on. You know, the, the potential, what Gilbert called PIP, the potential, uh, imp the performance improvement potential, that's a kind of a given. Now, whether we can achieve 100% of that potential or only 80%, it, you know, that's that's how well a job we can do and what's uh, possible in the real world. But, but we've got to be careful about ROI. But I fully support having a sense for what's the return on this investment. Is it a worthy investment? Because if we spend a dollar and get back 80 cents every time, we'll drive our companies bankrupt. 